Good morning. Welcome to The Edge. My name is Brandy, and I'm so glad that you've joined us in this series that we're calling Alpha, which is a place where we are exploring the basic foundational beliefs of the Christian faith. And it's also a safe space for us to lean in and ask those big questions about life and faith that so many of us find ourselves asking at some point in time or another. We've been exploring questions like, is there more to life than this? Questions like, how can I have faith? Or who even is Jesus? And why did he have to die? If these are any questions that you've had, or if you're curious about what it would look like to follow Christ, I would highly encourage you to go back and watch this series in its entirety. Because I think at the end of the day, we are all on this quest. We're all on this journey in life where we get this, this one shot and our life is going quickly. And I think we all want the same thing. We want that good life, right? I mean, we want to be good. We want to do good. And we want life to turn out good for us, don't we? But the question is, what really is the good life? And how will we define it? Or maybe the better question is, who gets to define it? As Christians, we believe that God is the source and the giver of all life, that everything that was made was made by him. So we allow him to define what that good life looks like. And not only to define it, but he is the one who enables us to live it. And trust me, when we choose to literally follow in the footsteps of Christ, it will lead us to paths that are full of purpose and peace and justice and love. Micah 6.8 says, For the Lord has shown you, O mortal one, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, that sounds like a pretty good life, right? I mean, if everybody could just do these things, wouldn't life be pretty good? <laughs> or even if we could just do one of those things, it would sure be a lot better, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine if just everyone around you could just learn to walk a little more humbly. Wouldn't life be a lot better? But as it turns out, carrying these things out on a consistent basis can be really difficult for humans, can't it? And you know what? God knew that it would be difficult. Impossible, in fact. But what is impossible for man is possible for God. And this is why he came, Emmanuel, God with us. You see, all the power in this verse really comes from that tiny little phrase at the end that says, with your God. See, God does not expect us to live the life that he designed for us alone. We're not even supposed to. And perhaps one of the greatest and also um, underused privileges of a Christian here on earth is the fact that we have a guide. God guides us. He guides his children. He leads the way. We are not left here on this earth to roam around like people walking around in darkness. We're not left here to carve out our own path. But the question that we're going to explore today is, 
How does God guide us? And if he guides us, then why are some Christians seeming to walk this confident life full of purpose that exudes the characteristics of Christ, while other Christians may have placed their faith in Christ, but their life does not seem to have much purpose and seems to be somewhat aimless. What's the difference? Well, the first thing is we have to literally let him lead. Let him be the guide. We are literally following Christ. It's his way, and we are following. And the choice is ours. So even though you may have placed your faith in Christ, the choice about whether you are going to listen to his voice, give authority to him in your life, be led by his spirit, and do what he says to do, that choice will be yours. But if you choose his ways, the benefits are exponential. So today we are taking an introductory look at the way that God guides, and he primarily guides his children in three ways. Through his word, the scripture, through his spirit or the Holy Spirit, and through prayer. It's really important that we understand in this introduction that these three things, his word, his spirit, and his prayer, they work in conjunction. We're meant to be operating with all of these things as our guide and not just in isolation. In fact, if we take any number of these things in isolation, it can even be somewhat dangerous and misleading. For example, if you're someone who loves to pray, but you really don't know his word, you could, uh, quite frankly, be praying out of God's will and think that you've heard him say something, but it doesn't actually align with his word nor his will. Or maybe you're someone who loves to read the Bible and you have a lot of biblical knowledge, but you don't have a spirit that is sensitive to his promptings. And so you have all of this knowledge, but really your life does not look like Christ because you are not walking in the ways that you're learning as you read. So these things are meant to not only be our guide, but to work together. I promise you, if you can call to your mind one of the most vibrant Christians you know, just think of somebody that you're like, I really admire that person's Christian walk. I promise you that is someone who has learned how to look at the scriptures to determine God's voice, who prays in accordance with God's will, and who is yielded to the Holy Spirit's promptings. Learning to let those things operate and be your guide is where the magic is going to happen. Over the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at each one of those three things in a deeper way specifically. But today, we're going to keep it in our minds that these things are working together and they go before us. I kind of like to think of it like if you've ever gone on a vacation and you have opted to uh, maybe go on one of those tours where you get to kind of see a new part of uh, the area where you're at, you'll often have a tour guide. And those tour guides are meant to, to guide you, right? We know that when you're following a tour guide that you're letting him lead the way. And we don't typically have a problem with that because we generally respect the fact that this tour guide knows the lay of the land. This tour guide knows to tell you, you know, don't step there, go check that place out. He can give you the history of this place. He can tell you the fun places to explore. He'll give you the time limits. And the purpose is so that you really will enjoy, explore, and understand this beautiful land that this tour guide has come to love and know so well. But he always has your safety in mind. And if we can think of it like that, then it's easier to trust and follow God's lead because he knows the lay of this land. In fact, he created it. 
Scripture says his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Listen, he knows the plans that he has for each one of you. And when we learn to recognize his voice through his word, it will not only guide us, but we will become better and better at recognizing his voice from the other voices that clamor in our heads for attention and direction. And once we begin to know his voice and walk in that direction in obedience, we begin to see and experience the fruit of going his way. And that's where we make history with God and trust in this relationship is built. And when trust gets built, it's a beautiful thing because it becomes easier and easier to do his will without requiring understanding or a certain outcome. I love when King David was beginning to figure this out and he penned these words, how can a man keep his way pure? By living according to the word. See, I love that because it's not just about reading the word or memorizing the word, but it's about living according to the word. This word of God's is alive and it's active and it is meant to inform our lifestyles. See, it's not just a book about God, although it is that. It's a book about creation. It's a book that tells the story of us of God's intentions for us, of his love for us. <laughs> it tells us about the fall of mankind and the way back home and our future home in glory. It's everything. It's a history book. It's a now book. It's a future book. But we are never meant to read it just to read it. We are meant to read it in order to live. His word is acting and alive. I love when I think about like, how would I explain to someone what the purpose of this Bible is really supposed to be? Yes, read it. Yes, it's helpful to memorize it so you can keep his voice in your head as a guide. But really, more than anything, it is meant to be lived out. I think of it like this. Um, if any of you have like a cookbook laying around your kitchen, even though that cookbook looks like your average book, you understand that while there are words on the page, and yes, you need to read it, and if it's a good recipe, you'll even want to memorize it or be able to paraphrase it in your head and throw that recipe together on your own. But more than that, you know that that cookbook is not intended to be read. It's intended so that you can follow that recipe put the ingredients together, and make a meal. And beyond making that meal, you're meant to eat it and enjoy it and even share it with others. And that's such a great parallel in my mind about Scripture. You know, Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We are living by his words, and we need his words. He doesn't want us to just know things like um, his mercies are new every morning. He wants us to experience his mercy afresh every morning. I love the quote that says something to the effect of the fact that when we open the Bible, this is the one book that we go to read and the author is always present with us. John 16, 13 says, the spirit of truth comes and he will guide us in all truth. And these are the two things that are working together. This is the great mystery of how his word comes alive to us. It is when his spirit opens it up for us in revelation. I wonder if you've ever had that experience. Maybe you've read the scriptures before and all of a sudden, a scripture that maybe you already knew, maybe you'd read it a bunch of times before, but all of a sudden, in this season of your life, at this very moment, all of a sudden, that piece of scripture jumps out at you. It's like somehow it seems to be in bold text 
Or maybe all of a sudden you have a brand new understanding, a deeper 3D understanding of a scripture that you only understood on a surface level at one point in time. This is the spirit working together with his word and bringing it to life for you. And the amazing thing is, the Spirit doesn't just bring his word to life for you or give you understanding, but it also will equip you with whatever it is calling you to do. In other words, when he gives you the understanding or the conviction or the encouragement or the direction, he's also giving you the strength and the support to carry it out. I love how scripture says that the spirit is working in us to will and to act according to God's purpose. I love it because that word working, his spirit is working. It's actually the original language. It's the word energio, energio. And of course, that looks a whole lot like our English word energy. Isn't that amazing? God says that his spirit will give us the energy energy to actually act this thing out. In fact, the definition says to be active, fervent, efficient, and even to be mighty in. Do you know what that means? (laughs) That means that we're not just going to get through this thing or slide by this thing. It means that we're going to have the energy to sustain us to do the thing that God is asking us to do and even be mighty in it. And prayer, of course, is what keeps this fire stoked. It's where you get to know him. And it's where you get to make your request known to him. See, God searches the heart of man He made you. He knows your heart. He knows your inner being and your thoughts. He already knows what you're thinking and feeling. And still, he encourages us in his word to make our request known to him. Why? Well, it says to cast all of our cares on him because he cares for you. It's your heart. It's this relationship that he's after. Remember, he knows the plans he has for you, and they're good. He designed you to live a life that's good, a life that would personally experience his goodness, his love, and his mercy, and a life that it would extend those things to the world around you with God. And remember, he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wonder if you might be in this journey of life right now and feel weighed down or burdened by life. Have you given your life to Christ? Or maybe you have given your life to Christ, but there's something, there's one of these elements that's missing Maybe you're reading scripture, maybe you're praying, but your spirit is not being open to his leading. Or maybe you've been praying a lot, but you haven't been reading his words, so you you feel disconnected, like you're not hearing from him. He wants to be in communication with you. He wants to guide you. You know, when I think about the scripture and his word and his spirit, all working together, and a life that is yielded to his guidance can be trusted and can be good. I think of one example off the top of my head. I have many from my own life where I know that I have been guided by God, but there is one that tops it all because it kind of utilizes all three of these things at once. Some of you may have heard me say this example before because I believe I've told it in this church some years ago. But many years ago, when all three of our kids were very little, they were three and under, our our household kind of grew overnight when we went from being parents of a toddler to parents of a toddler and twins. Except the problem was we lived in a really, really tiny townhome. 
with very little space. In fact, it was so tiny that my husband and I, we would get this mattress out from our garage and we would pull it in and put it in the living room floor and make our bed like every night. And it was like this convertible home. Like it was our bedroom at night and then it was the living room by day in order to give our kids some bedrooms and try to get some peace and quiet at night. But life was hard and it was one of those seasons, I wonder if you've had one like this, it was one of those seasons in life where that wasn't the only thing that was hard. It was a season where it seemed like everything was hard, everything, you name it, financial, relational, um, church, work, physical, family, all of it, everything was hard. And for some reason, I can't explain exactly why, but for some reason in my mind, the one thing that could make things a little bit easier to deal with, the one thing in my mind was if we just had a house that was big enough for our family. That was my big request. That was the thing that I longed for. And somehow in my mind, if we had that, everything else would at least feel a little bit more manageable. But the problem was to get a house that was suitable for our family size at that point in time, financially speaking, was impossible for us. In fact, it was in 2008 and the housing market was totally upside down and it would have taken thousands and thousands of dollars just to be able to move out of our house, much less afford a down payment on another one. It was impossible. But remember, what is impossible for man is possible for God. And I remember calling on my grandma Judy, someone that I called to often whenever I just needed to talk. And I remember talking to her about this and her saying to me, you know, Brandy, I really think you need to take this to God in prayer and just make your request known to him and really believe, really believe that his plan for you is good and that he's going to give you what you need. Now, trust me, I had prayed about this before, and I was a little irritated by her advice, but I also kind of knew in my heart that I had given up on praying for it. I had stopped. And so this time, for whatever reason, I hung up the phone and I decided, I'm really going to pray about this again. This time, I'm going to do it full of faith. And so I did. And the most amazing thing happened. Shortly thereafter, I had opened my Bible, and I don't even know what it was. It must have been the Spirit. But it was that, that kind of an incident where a little passage jumped out at me off of the page as if it was in bold text, and it was a verse from Psalms. I believe it was Psalm 18, 19, and it said that the Lord delivered me to a spacious place because he delighted in me. And I'm telling you, I read that and I got the chills and I got choked up because I was the only one in my room. My prayer was totally silent. And I knew when I read that, right after I'd prayed, I knew he had heard me and he was telling me that he had it, that he had it for us. And so to to exercise this, this faith that I had, that he was speaking to me through his word, I actually put a little date right next to the scripture so that I would remember that he had in fact spoken to me. And I even, to help exercise this faith, uh, started telling other people that I knew that God was going to do this impossible thing for us. Except the problem was time went by. Months went by. And honestly, even a couple of years went by. And nothing changed about our situation. Well, in fact, one thing changed, and that was that our financial situation only got more desperate. So this impossible situation only became more impossible. And I had truly begun to, began to shut my heart off, and I sort of went back to reading the Bible like a good Christian girl and just looking at it like it was the right thing to do. I no longer felt vulnerable to, to wanting to look at it as a way that God might communicate with me because I felt disappointed and let down and hurt. But then something amazing happened. Over time, and again, I cannot explain this except for God's Spirit, Over time, 
Neil and I began to actually kind of enjoy this town home a little more. We began to have a, a better connection with our neighbors. Uh, we kind of fell into a routine and actually bringing that mattress out at night, we'd kind of pop the popcorn and we'd start watching movies and we'd call it our little date night camp outs in the living room and somehow we even started enjoying this house. I became really good at becoming a minimalist before it was cool. And somehow we were happy and I no longer felt like I needed a bigger space in order to be happy. Yet still, my heart ached with disappointment, thinking that he had spoken to me in his word after I had prayed and wondering what on earth that was all about. Until it was around Christmas time, and my family had gone down to my parents' house for the week, and I had forgotten to bring my Bible, and so I was there uh, early in the morning, and I reached over, and I grabbed one of the Bibles that my parents had on the nightstand by the bed, and I opened the Bible, and there's a bookmark in the Bible. And you're probably going to guess where I'm going with this, but I just opened the Bible up where the bookmark was, and guess where it fell? It landed directly in Psalm 18, and my eyes immediately fell to that verse. For the Lord delivered me to a spacious place because he delighted in me. And it felt like a dagger in my heart to read it again and be reminded again that here I am two years later and nothing changed. But at the end of this verse, there was a little footnote and that footnote, it showed to look at the bottom of the page for a deeper understanding of the context of this verse. And when I looked down at the footnote, it had a broader meaning for the original intention of that word, spacious. And what I thought could have only meant spacious like in a physical sense, it explained in that footnote that the word spacious actually meant a place of contentedness. And I immediately began to choke up because I knew that God had indeed answered my prayer. And he did an even bigger miracle than providing us with a physical house. He did a miracle in my heart because he allowed me to be content in a place that I thought I needed to be different in order to be content. Truly, I experienced the truth of godliness with contentedness is great gain. And then the most amazing thing happened. I mean, I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. We ended up, after that wonderful week of Christmas, we ended up packing up our bags, coming back home, and that very next week at church, after my husband was done preaching a sermon, someone came up and approached him after the service with tears in his eyes, and he said, I really need to talk to you. Can I come over tonight and visit with you and your wife? It's important. So, of course, we made space for that to happen, and he came over, and he went on to explain to us that he absolutely knew that God was prompting him. He had this lump sum of money, and he had plans for that money, and he thought that those plans for that money was something else, but God had directed him and showed him what that money was for, and he believed fully that that money was for us, and it was to get us out of our house. And I tell you what, I could not believe it. I mean, this was a modern day miracle. And sure enough, he delivered us to the beautiful home that we live in now. And I never take this home for granted. I wake up all the time and I know this house is a gift from the Lord. But I want to tell you in all sincerity that the bigger miracle that I still get more excited about today than even the house is the miracle that he did in my heart. And the fact that he showed me that he hears my prayers, that he speaks to me, that he sees me, that he knows what I need, and that he really does guide us and communicate with us. And now I don't read his word just because it's the right thing to do. 
or just to know more about him. I run to his word literally daily like a kid runs to recess, you know what I mean, on the playground, because I need his word. I don't want to live a day without knowing what he has to say to me or without the sense that he is guiding me. And he doesn't just want that for me. He wants it for you. So I hope that you will get excited for these next few weeks as we look even deeper into the ways that he speaks to us and he guides us through his word, through his spirit, and through prayer so that we can live a life that walks the path of Jesus to to love justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Now, if you're in a house church today, we really encourage you to be asking some questions and really discussing some of what has taken place this morning. And and here are a few questions that you could consider. Uh, One of them is just really after listening to this message, what is kind of that big takeaway for you? Remember, God has a message just for you. What was that thing today that you know was for you? And another question that you might consider is of these three primary ways that God guides us, his word, his spirit, and prayer, which one of those are pretty easy for you to look to on a regular basis? And maybe is there one of those that you're more reluctant or hesitant, or maybe you've just kind of neglected? And finally, I think it would be awesome if you would just share about a time in your life when you know that God guided you. Our testimonies can be so powerful and effective. And even telling your own testimony again can can strengthen your faith to remind you that God does, in fact, guide and you are never alone. Church, I hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.